Ah, the 1960s are here. Another spectrum of hues shall fill our screens, allowing us to even better reflect upon our humanity and in humanity. La Casa del Terror, House of Terror, 1960. The 1960s again start flat-faced, with large ears, pronounced bottom canines, and yet a new take on the nose. An improvement on the original Universal Studios Wolfman? It seems to work with those outstretched eyebrows. The Curse of the Werewolf, 1961, our first colored werewolf movie that fortunately took advantage of the new technology. Eyes turned blue, body covered in whitening fur, and tastefully added facial features that were not overdone, yet expressed the monster within well. Idyllic choices that created a werewolf great enough to stand the test of time. Werewolf in the Girls' Dormitory, also known as Lycanthropus, 1961, Back to Black and White. A very subtle take on the Wolfman's appearance, enough so that he could be taken as a vampire, especially within the movies of the 21st century. The good? Aesthetically alright, with nothing really ridiculous to the design. Beauty and the Beast, 1962, transforming during full moons and very reminiscent of Universal Studios' original Wolfman, we won't be accepting every monster of Beauty and the Beast, but for this human changeling we'll make an exception. An interesting pairing of savage and elegant. Frankenstein, the Vampire and Company, 1962, arguably the worst design to this date. Stiff, uninspired fur patching, and comical eyebrows. Obviously, the Wolfman here is just that, a mere part of the company. House on Bear Mountain, 1962. Surprisingly, even this semi-adult movie has a better Wolfman than the previous film, though not much, as probably the most monstrous thing about him is his towering height. No, I'm not the fuzz. I'm Jimmy Scott. Samson, or Santo, versus the Vampire Women, 1962. Santo is at it again as he reveals and battles the werewolf upon the ring. Overall, not bad effects, nothing really new. The bare body is of course a letdown, but for this type of film and monster design, it somewhat works. Improving his attacks could have really helped the scene. Santo, or Samson, in the Wax Museum, 1963. And here our adventures with Santo take us to a wax museum where we encounter a couple of the were beasties. Again, the effects have only taken place on the face, but it's nice to see the variety. Yaban Ren Lang, also known as Midnight Werewolf, 1963. Probably the first Asian lycanthrope film. Nothing impressive, another fairly fresh take on the beastie that is slightly suggestive of the Japanese oni or demons. The predominant unibrow was certainly a first. Face of the Screaming Werewolf, 1964. This movie is a merged combination of Mexican movies La Casa del Terror and La Momia Azteca, with minimal new footage to better sync the two. Hence we see Lon Chaney Jr.'s Wolfman again. Literally nothing new on that behalf here. Ursus e Tarora de Kirgizi, or Hercules, Prisoner of Evil, 1964. This Italian flick honors the werewolf as a worthy opponent of Hercules, though the wolf part is once again ambiguous as he could just as well be a werebear. The concept itself is a hideous, hairy, human changeling. Doctor Terrors, House of Terrors, 1965. Attractive title with an average at best production. The film is divided into five mini-stories that take place within the house, one of which has the werewolf, who is unfortunately barely visible in the film, and takes on the full wolf form in nature when completely transitioned. El Charo de las Calaveras, or Rider of the Skulls. 1965. Here a cowboy faces many monsters, among them one which can give all other wolfmen a run for their money as to being either the furriest and or the longest furred. Actually, in clarity, the face is quite freaky and with what's going on there, that unibrow conforms well. El Demonio Azul, or Black Demon, 1965. Another Mexican wrestler hero, like Santo, takes upon a lycanthrope that really had some things going for it as far as facial special effects. The rest of the body and head in particular didn't follow in well, but it seemed they were headed in the right direction with this one. La Loba, or The She-Wolf, 1965. Finally, we have a visual representation of a female werewolf hybrid form type. 
a wolf woman. Both the male and female become covered in hair and fur, her with more and much longer portions, but him with more facial coverage. Otherwise, the faces remain quite mundane. Orgy of the Dead, 1965. With what the actual movie is, the Wolfman is quite aesthetically pleasing, possessing more of the white streaks we first saw in the teenage werewolf of the 1950s. I would have liked to have seen more of this, though it's possible the hair might subtract from the scariness. Gallery of Horrors, which can also be found under a variety of other titles, 1966. A low-budget disappointment with very brief, unimpressive werewolf footage. Monster Go Home. 1966, the monster's first full-length film, and not just that, but in Technicolor. The werewolf here being, of course, the boy Eddie Munster. Nothing too flashy or, shall we say, furry, but the strong widow's peak and pointy ears made for a trademark look not to be forgotten. La Marca del Hombre Lobo, 1967. Also known as Frankenstein's Bloody Terror in the slightly altered English-dubbed version. Fanged, dark, and intense. It was this movie that started it all for Spanish actor Paul Nashi. As for the next few decades, he was the wolf man. Mad Monster Party, 1967. Ah, here it is, the first film to feature a truer werewolf rather than wolf man slash woman. Meaning by some standards, more wolf than human. First film indeed, but not the first live action, as this was stop motion puppetry. Blood of Dracula's Castle, 1969. Although there was no visual of a werewolf in the theatrical release, TV's version did present us with something. Albeit a masked creation, this concept would have been awesome to see done well, especially for the time. The Maltese Bippy, 1969. A rare werewolf find as was the previous. This one also seems to be inching toward a more animal-ish character with that pronounced muzzle. For a comedy, this creation's design was actually clean and memorable. Not a great ending to the decade, but an interesting one. We did get teased with the more beastly form of the puppet werewolf in Mad Monster Party. But just how much longer until we see something like that in a live action film? With the experimentations and extending the mouth and nose out in a couple productions here, I'm sure it won't be long. Let's see just how much more humankind we can leave behind in our werewolves of the 1970s.